This is the presentation on labor law. This is a, will be a, a general overview to make you familiar with the legislation, um, uh, make you familiar with the uh, National Labor Relations Board, uh, some major problems, and um, union certification process um, generally. Uh, and um, some do's and don'ts in, in terms of unfair labor practices that can get both employers and unions in trouble. First, we're going to go over the major labor legislation in the United States. Keep in mind that our labor protections are not nearly as great as the labor protection in the EU. We don't have uh, work councils, meaning we don't have um, we don't have representation of workers on um, boards of directors at at board meetings. Um, as um, really, this is what this is what Volkswagen Corporation uh, wants to have done in uh, its Chattanooga assembly plant. So we're, we're very similar. But, um, we're, we're similar in the protection, but we don't go nearly as far. All right, let's go historically speaking. We need to develop what the, what the problems were and uh, how Congress has um, addressed these problems over the years. Clayton Act of 1914, which was the first one, um, the Clayton Act is principally an antitrust law, but it has a labor law provision. Railway Labor Act of 1926, Norris LaGuardia Act of 1932, the Wagner Act of 1934, this is also called the National Labor Relations Act. This was the, the big one. The Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, the Landrum-Griffin Act of 1959, also called the Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act. We'll talk um, a little about each one of those in just a minute. First thing we've got to do is uh, distinguish the policies of, um, with respect to right to work. We have uh, three broad policies. Um, that um, that some states fall into. Um, some are more pro-worker than other. The closed shop is a condition whereby the union membership is a condition preceding to employment in a particular trade or calling. The um, heavy union uh, unionized states um, prefer this one. Um, this is the one where, where the... Um, um, where the Democrats would prefer, um, think of states like New York, uh, New Jersey, um, Ohio, for example, uh, historically in that. If you want to work there, if the employer requires, uh, or if, there's, if, if the employer's plant is unionized, then you have to also be a union member in order to work there. Open shop. This is um, just the kind of the opposite of it. A worker does not have to join a union to be employed by the employer. This is a, more of a right to work concept that um, a growing number of the states follow. Tennessee, that way, the southern states. Um, you're seeing more of the Midwestern states follow uh, in that direction. Um, Indiana, Ohio. I'm not sure if the whole country will be this way, but at least there's it's it's moving. It's moving in in this direction. This is um, the open shop, right to work. Uh, considers um, limiting ability a person's ability to work because um, um, for the requirement of uh, joining a union. Uh, is is repugnant to the Constitution's individual right of free association. 
should not be a condition of employment. And then, of course, the middle ground is union shop, condition whereby, by agreement, uh, between the union and management, the union membership is not a prerequisite for employment, but can and usually does require that employer, that a worker, workers after they're hired to join a union after a specified amount of time on the job. You can see how that fits in the middle. The courts have found certain fundamental rights. And here, obviously, the U.S. Supreme Court being the most important. And these fundamental rights guide um, workers uh, and employers and unions. First, there's a fundamental right to bargain. This fundamental right to bargain is between labor and management on certain mandatory issues. Meaning, if, if workers want to be able to bargain, form a union to bargain, then they have, this is a fundamental right. It's their decision. The employer cannot prevent them. These um, mandatory subjects, wages, hours, and other terms and conditions of employment. What's this other terms and conditions of employment? These are conditions that, uh, terms and conditions that can cause an individual to be disciplined or terminated. Right? Clothing. Um, well, maybe not, not clothing. Um, um, the um, checking of lunch boxes um, at, um, by supervisors at work on construction sites and things of this nature. Um, how you handle, um, how, how you um, rank um, the pay, how you give um, assigned jobs and things of this nature. Now, this fundamental right to bargain over wages, hours, and other terms and conditions of employment means that both the union and management are obligated to negotiate in good faith in good faith until an impasse is reached. So how long? Until an impasse is reached, meaning that if they're both negotiating in good faith and they simply cannot reach an agreement. It is not a predetermined it is not a it is not a predetermined condition. After an impasse is reached after they've negotiated. The management has a right to relocate work, terminate workers, and farm out work to non-union plants and workers. In essence, the, the company is free. There's also a fundamental right found by the U.S. Supreme Court fundamental right of management to go out of business. Sometimes a um, company simply cannot accept a union. And rather than face a union, it may simply prefer just to go out of business. No longer do that line of work. I'm not talking here about transferring the line of work to a non-union facility or something of this nature. I'm talking about you're just not doing it. This was found, this fundamental right to go of a of company go out to go out of existence was found by the U.S. Supreme Court in First National Maintenance Corporation. Um, an example of this also uh, occurred once with Walmart a Walmart store that had a meat market in which they had um, butchers employed in that meat market and and they were cutting up meat. All right, so what you would have is you would have, you know, let's say a, a side of beef come in to the Walmart store and you would have butchers uh, there 
cutting up the meat uh, and packaging the meat, you know, or selling it, and maybe even doing custom, um, custom cutting and packaging for customers. Uh, the, the meat cutters wanted to form a union. Walmart said, no, can't have it. Um, and rather than accept a union, and keep in mind, we're not talking about a large number of employees. You can have a fairly small number of employees who um, um, seek to have a union, be, to be represented by a union. It does not have to be the whole plant or the whole facility. It can be an identifiable group of employees with common um, the, with common interests, common skills. So Walmart decided to terminate all of the meat cutting at that store. They simply just brought the meat in from uh, other meat markets Right? They bought the meat prepackaged, and therefore they no longer used the meat cutting services, and there was no uh, violation of the National Labor Relations Act. They took advantage of their fundamental right to go out of business. The Clayton Act, um, the first of the labor law provisions, as I said, it was mainly um, antitrust law, but keep in mind the activities of unions, of workers, to act in concert is um, meaning they are acting together to restrain trade. Congress, in 1914, under the Clayton Act, prohibits courts from enforcing union activities. I'm sorry. To pro it prohibits courts from enjoining, meaning to stop union activities such as strikes and pickets, walkouts, things of this nature. Put another way, the antitrust provisions are not applicable to labor management um, activities. 1926, the Railway Labor Act. Keep in mind that in 1926, automobiles were small and slow and trucks were small and slow. So the principal ways of getting, uh, and, and there's not a whole lot of air travel. So, you know, air and rail were the principal transportation industries. It... Uh, the Railway Labor Act encourages collective bargaining as a means of settling labor disputes. It permits union shop. It established the National Mediation Board to assist in resolving disputes. If, um, if um, the um, Railway Workers Union uh, got in a dispute with... Um, um, with with the company and um, the whole union were decided to, to have a work stoppage. Uh, it would have a devastating effect on the U.S. economy and commerce and therefore under the Railway Labor Act the president could uh, require the parties to um, go to mediation. The Norris LaGuardia Act of 1932. Keep in mind at this point, at this point in time, employers were much stronger than the union, than the workers. And this is because of the Great Depression. And so, early Early on, it was the employers that had the great um, power over, over workers. Ideally, what you would have is you would have, it would almost be like a seesaw, ideally, in which 
both persons sitting on the seesaw on opposite ends would be of the same size. Meaning that you would, the seesaw would be flat, neither side having power to override the other one. That's ideal. And that's where you want it. But um, after the Great Depression, there was a, a huge surplus of labor. And so employers could control them. So Congress in 1932, this is, this is uh, one of the uh, Franklin Roosevelt pieces of legislation that were, um, were pro-worker. Uh, they made yellow dog contracts illegal. A yellow dog contract is a nice, nice term, colorful term, where employment contracts that prohibit union membership were illegal. Norris LaGuardia also made uh, the following union activities exempt from court in injunction. Striking or quitting work, belonging to labor organization, paying strike or unemployment benefits to the striker, publicizing or picketing a labor dispute, peaceable assembly regarding a labor dispute, and agreeing with others to do any of the, the above. So in essence, it's broader than the Clayton Act of 1914 because it's specific. Um, this is the Wagner Act of 1935, also called the National Labor Relations Act. It is um, generally the most important of the provisions. And again, keep in mind, we still have a large glut of labor from the Great Depression. So this is pro-union. The purpose of the Wagner Act was to protect the right of workers to collectively bargain as a fundamental right. It extends to all non-union workers as well. So one of the fallacies of labor law is, look, if, if my company is not organized. There's no union organization in my company. I don't have to deal with labor law at all. And that's not true. Because workers have a right under Section 8A of the National Labor Relations Act to act in concert for their mutual aid and protection. Under Section 8A of the National Labor Relations Act to act in concert for their mutual aid and protection. Right? So they can have meetings. They can have, they can have, um, they can use the employer's email system after work in order to do that. And, and under the timekeeping system, the employer does not have the right to monitor emails written by, by and between workers discussing employer's policy if the purpose of that discussion, of that email, was so that they can act in concert for their mutual aid and protection. The key provisions of the National Labor Relations Act, or the Wagner Act, was first it created the National Labor Relations Board. This is a federal administrative agency that has um, jurisdiction over la labor management relations. The act provides for a means of um, a board supervised union elections. Provides for a process. It outlawed certain acts by employers as unfair labor practices. We'll talk about uh, with more specificity about the uh, management unfair labor practices later. And uh, the NLRB has. Um, has jurisdiction to hold hearings and to investigate and to take corrective action um, if employers, i.e. management, undertake any of these unfair labor practices. The NLRB can issue cease and desist orders and even award damages to unions and employees. 
Then, the National Labor Relations Act protects workers' right to act in concert for their mutual aid and protection, which we've talked about. Let's talk about the National Labor Relations Board. Usually we think of the National Labor Relations Board, the NLRB, of um, just considering the large companies. Well, they obviously do um, try to devote as, as much time because of scarce resources, and um, they devote to large companies and issues of large companies, uh, union elections of large companies, but they don't have to. They can apply to uh, any workers. The sanctions of the NLRB are varied and usually are specially tailored to the situation. They can order reinstatement of employment. They can order new union elections. They can um, award money damages and cease and desist orders. Take, for example, uh, I guess it was um, 10, 15 years ago, um, as if I recall correctly, there was a work um, slow down by the pilots at FedEx. Um, in essence, their, their union had basically given them instructions you know, not to show up to work to claim that they were sick. And this was happening uh, during the busy season around Christmas, before Christmas. And um, a claim was filed by FedEx against the union um, as a violation, under a violation, under, under an unfair labor practices practice of the union um, and the union ordered uh, them to stop that and awarded some money damages to FedEx if I remember correctly the NLRB supervises elections by the workers uh, of the type of union to represent them and the organizations or crafts units to vote on being uh, included in the union vote. As I said before, not you know, uh, not every uh, organization that elects a union elects it for the whole company. You may very well have bargaining units that are based on crafts, for example, common for the crafts. Um, like uh, sheet metal workers, or pipe fitters, or welders, uh, or cement uh, finishers, and things of this nature. Anyway, the NLRB supervises the election first as to what groups, what bargaining units are going to be in there, and then what union will represent, because sometimes multiple unions uh, want to be, want to represent these, this particular bargaining unit. The uh, act of the National Labor Relations Board is appealable, appealable to the Circuit Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Uh, but the decision will not be overturned unless it can be shown that it's an obvious attempt to achieve ends contrary to the policies of the law, meaning there's a lot of deference given to the National Labor Relations Board. Next comes the Taft-Hartley Act. All right, I gave you the example of what, what the preference is, a neutrality, labor management neutrality, of the seesaw with persons of equal uh, size. Now, all the way up, up through the 1930s, it was the employer was the big kid on the seesaw. And so labor 
because of the surplus in the labor market, labor was, was up high and they couldn't force the seesaw to go down. With, the, uh, with World War II, so many of the men had um, joined the, the service or drafted into the service that um, the labor surplus was gone. And in fact, is the power had then shifted over to the unions. And so the union became the large person on the seesaw. So Congress, in order to bring about the equilibrium, enacted the Taft-Hartley Act. And this is a piece of legislation that old, um, old uh, hardline liberal um, Democrat senators would spit at um, whenever they heard or mentioned the name Taft-Hartley. Taft-Hartley prohibited unfair labor practices of unions. It prohibited closed shop. It allowed the were the states to determine whether or not they wanted to be have be right to work states. We talked about before, right? Um, no employer can be required to pay agency fees. Now it did have an agency shop allowed where uh, non-union workers uh, must pay the agency fees to recover the cost of labor negotiations that increase wages. Keep in mind that non-union workers benefit from the use um, or the bargaining and representation by other employees of, um, of a union. And what, um, what the agency shop allows is for uh, not to have any freeloading, which certainly makes sense. It did preserve, Taft-Hartley did preserve the union shop. And then the Landrum-Griffin Act. I apologize for um, the cutoff of... Um, The, um, the PowerPoint. The concern here was the power of the unions. In essence, it became almost like the union was uh, under such dominant control of the union bosses that they, you know, in t at times would work against the rank and file in terms of salaries and benefits and what they would do and loaning money, um, you know, giving shakedown money to, um, at least alleged shakedown money to, um, um, to corrupt um, mafia uh, folks and such like that. So Landrum Griffin was intended to protect the rank and file against egregious acts of the union official. It amended the National Labor Relations Act. The purpose was to enforce accounting and financial disclosure of union activities. To know, to allow the rank and file, the union members, to know where the union's money was spent. And it provided for penalties for breach of trust or wrongdoing the theft or bribery um, of the union officials. It granted the union members a bill of rights by giving the members due process in punishment situations. Sometimes the union would uh, take coercive action against the rank and file. I want to, um, to take you back here with Landrum Griffin uh, some years back, um, you know, 15 years ago maybe, um, yeah, 15 years ago, something like that, there was um, the, the head of the Teamsters Union. Um, used the union's money in order to seek re-election 
They used the rank and file, you know, the funds of the rank and file, and um, and the power that he had under the union, and the power to spend money, in order to um, uh, better itself, to give it more power, um, to promote itself for a re-election as the head of the uh, of the union. Now, Jimmy Hoffa Jr. was running against. Uh, this head, the head of the union, and um, he did not have this wherewithal. He had the name, obviously, because you know his his father being the Jimmy Hoffa uh, of the Teamsters Union. So, um, as it worked out, the incumbent won the election, and um, a complaint was filed by Jimmy Hoffa Jr that um, the election was improper because of the abuses, the financial abuses, by the uh, president of the union. And the National Labor Relations Board reviewed it and found that the, the president of the union had violated um, the Landrum-Griffin Act and overturned the election and required a new election um, closer scrutinized by the NLRB, um, prohibiting the spending of union money um, by the head, by the uh, president of the union. And in that um, re uh, re election, Jimmy Hoffa Jr. became the new president. Let's talk about, very briefly, about the union certification process. Now this was there was some talk a few years back about um, making this much more streamlined, giving the workers much more say, giving much more deference to workers than management, and uh, and um, the Republicans stood up against it, and uh, and so did employers, and it never came about. Basically, allowing. Um, allowing the unions to get cards signed and then not having the requirement for a union election at all. All right, so this union election certification process, it's an election process, uh, is one in which the employees seek a union to represent them. You know, we have multiple unions, and so there's always infighting to see who's going to control it. A union can salt an employer. Can salt an employer. That means that a union can send a worker in um, to get a job there to work at that employer's facility, and that worker is. And this is the term salt, and that worker then works to have uh, other workers or encourage other workers to. Um, seek uh, union certification. They don't have to tell the employer of the worker's dual status. Now that may you would think that this is uh, that is an unethical situation, but it's it's not outside of the law. Union representatives obtain, employee signatures on authorization cards. And these authorization cards simply state that the employee wishes to have a union certification vote. It does not say that it wants the employee wants to have a union. It simply says it wants to have a vote. And this is part of the problem with, um, with what was planned before or what was um, proposed before, um, and that was uh, let the... Um, authorization cards control. If the union obtains authorization cards from at least 30% of the workers in the collective bargaining unit, now keep in mind, a collective bargaining unit does not mean the whole company. It just simply means this is the group of workers that have similar interests that they can be represented by a union. So if 
within the workers, and it can be a large department, it can be a division, um, it can be a, a group within, a group of uh, tradesmen within uh, manufacturing. If that's the bargaining unit, then getting the cards from 30% or more means that the NLRB will certify the election. Doesn't mean certify the union as their representative body. It simply means that there can be an election. The NLRB certifies the collective bargaining unit and the election. Continuing on, a majority vote of the um, voters in um, in the collective bargaining unit um, wins. Then the NLRB certifies the union representative uh, union's uh, representation of the workers. Let's take for example a hospital. Now, southern hospitals outside the very large cities in the south simply uh, do not like union representation. In the large cities, you know, up north or on the west coast, not an uncommon thing to have a hospital represented by a union. But down south, we are uh, our our nurses are fiercely independent. They probably need nurses probably need union representation more than than um, than most groups, simply because of the conditions of employment. So if um, let's suppose that a hospital, um, w uh, the workers were. Um, we're talking up a union. They wanted union uh, representation. What would a hospital want to do? Uh, the hospital would probably want to um, want to broaden the um, the number of people in the collective bargaining unit as a as a strategy or tactic to defeat the union. For example, you would want um, say the nurses. And the professional staff, register, you know, uh, respiratory therapists and such, to be included in the collective bargaining unit. So, the um, CNAs or the cafeteria workers, for example, uh, or the admin people, they would have their vote um, somewhat diluted. Now, the NLRB could still certify the collective bargaining unit for the lower-paid workers. It may very well do that because the lower-paid workers, uh, cafeteria workers, the orderlies, the uh, certified nursing assistants, and things of this nature, right, they would have common interests, whereas the professional staff, the registered nurses, and the um, um, respiratory therapists and so forth would not have common interests with the lower paid workers. There's a pre-certification election, uh, unfair labor practices uh, of management. You can have, and this is one uh, pre-certification election unfair labor practice of management would be where management interferes with this election process, threatens workers, for example, uh, puts out false uh, misleading information about the union and about the effect. You can also have pre-certification uh, election unfair labor practices of the union. Maybe union representatives or thugs hired by the unions uh, or other um, other um, employees within the bargaining unit, they threaten workers with bodily harm um, if they uh, don't vote for union certification. Now, once there's a union certification election, under the 12-month rule, uh, you can't have another vote to certify or decertify a union.
after a union is certified as the collective bargaining representative of the employees, then the collective bargaining process begins. The union negotiates for the members, and the members, other than their vote to ratify the collective bargaining agreement, um, is of no consequence. Let's talk about the labor manage, um, la unfair labor practices. First of management, then of union, because most of the unfair labor practices will be against management rather than unions. First, if there's a refusal to negotiate in good faith over the mandatory subjects of um, bargaining, wages, hours, and other terms and conditions of employment, the refusal to negotiate in good faith is an unfair labor practice for which sanctions can be applied. Coercion of employees, either actual or threatened intimidation, interference with an employee's right to carry out a concerted activity in dealing with management, You don't let them um, put up um, flyers and things in the common area. Now keep in mind there's no requirement of management to allow time for discussion of union, union during the work state at workstations or during work time. And if there's a broad, if there is a, if, if there is a, a good um, anti -solic no solicitation, non solicitation policy. There is, there uh, you can prohibit them, the union from soliciting, talking up, any place, on the property. Number four, making threats or carrying out physical attacks against union or non union members. Some of you may have seen movies. Um, from the from the 1930s um, and uh, 1940s and in, in 1920s as well um, in the automobile industry about how some um, workers were were treated where um, you know large automobile manufacturer would hire thugs to beat up uh, protesters and things of this nature. Number five, offering or giving pay raises or other benefits to workers to encourage them to vote against the union certification. Now, the workers may be better off if management gives them a pay raise, and they certainly would be better off. And But you can see how the promising to give a pay raise or the actual giving the pay raise would interfere with the election vote or interfere with um, um, the certification uh, activities. So even though the workers may be better off, it's, un it's not allowed. Continuing on, making untruthful statements about the effect of the union certification will have on the employer and its employees. You're allowed to speak truthful, truthfully. An employer, management is allowed to speak truthfully to the workers. But the man management cannot be coercive of the workers. Management cannot threaten the workers. They can talk about what what this will do to them. You know, truthfully, what a union election will do to um, um, the bottom line of the company, what it will do to cost, what it will do to competitiveness of the company, what it will do um, to a, wor a particular worker's right to negotiate compensation increases or special provisions, which would not be authorized. It's an unfair labor practice if management threatens to shut down a plant or to fire workers if a union is certified. 
just because management runs the company for shareholders and has the money does not mean that it has that broad of power. It's an unfair labor practice for management to prohibit the wearing of pro-union hats and t-shirts and buttons at work unless the employer has a policy requiring all employees to wear uniforms of which such items would not conform. All right, so there's two areas where a company may very well want to have hard policies. One is non, you know, non-solicitation policies. I mean, you don't have you don't sell anything. You don't allow workers to sell anything. You know, Girl Scout cookies are are is, seems to be an exception. Uh, we will allow them to sell um, workers to sell Girl Scout cookies without um, violating non-solicitation provisions. But you can't allow workers to say, for example, to sell Amway or um, insurance policies and things of this nature. That would violate the non-solicitation agreement. And if you allow the non-solicitation agreement to be violated, then you can't uh, hold fast to that non-solicitation uh, policy when it comes to union activities. And the same way with uniforms. If you let workers wear University of Tennessee ball caps or UT sweatshirts or t-shirts and such like that, then they have a right to also wear um, United Auto Workers or United Steel Workers or Teamsters or um, AFSCME, uh, if I can recall, AFSCME, um, it's, it's for state um, and municipal employees union. They have a right to wear it. If you don't want any discussion of the union, you don't want to have any symbols of the union, then you have to have the non-solicitation policy in effect and applied, and um, and um, union uh, and uniforms, a uniform policy. It's an unfair labor practice to prevent workers from talking about union activities or passing out union leaflets during break time, or in non-work areas. Now, obviously, as I said before, workers don't have a right to carry on these union activities during um, uh, the work time and in work areas. Now, as I, what I said before about the non-solicitation policies, then that would apply, that would prohibit it. It's an unfair labor practice to have a lockout before the union and management have bargained in good faith to an impasse. Briefly, let's look at unfair labor practices of unions, because sometimes they do things wrong. Economic strikes before the union and management have bargained in good faith to an impasse. You know, jumping the gun. Secondary boycotts. Coercing or threatening physical uh, or physically attacking workers into voting for a union re and refusing to negotiate in good faith. Some um, some law firms uh, represent uh, management. Some law firms represent labor. I happen to work in Nashville with a law firm that specialized in uh, in uh, representing management. King and Below um, National uh, Recognition for of uh, what they do in, um, in um, labor uh, management relations in assisting companies. They, have, uh, they, they do what is commonly uh, argued against, and that's taking a very aggressive position in favor of management. Usually, you, um, you, you attack, you, you don't attack 
the um, the union. Generally, let's let's keep a good relationship with the union. Well, sometimes that doesn't work out. And um, for example, um, King and Baloo's policy was that that in order to defeat a union, you have to show the union that you don't need them. And sometimes that required the supervisors and management taking over operation of the company if there is a strike. Now, there's good side to that and bad side to that. Um, once workers get hungry enough, they will go back to work. They will accept less. The bad side of it is is the continued hostility. Let's uh, end our discussion of the um, of labor management relations, labor law here. Um, the next uh, lecture video and employment and labor law will be sex discrimination.